My friends, it's Uncle Night Shift, and tonight we're gonna take this Yak Tiger, which we constructed in the previous episode using Tacom's 135th kit, some Voyager Photo Edge, and Freel model tracks. So, we're gonna take it, disassemble it, and do some painting. Of course, I mean just the basic painting, like camouflage, decals, and some details, and the weathering. We'll keep that for the upcoming episodes. So, as usual, it starts with disassembling. I'll be definitely putting this figure aside because I'm still not quite sure if and how I'm gonna paint him. And that's also why the hatch can be closed at any point. And then of course the remaining parts. This hugely depends on which details you decide to keep removable. And it all comes down to what you prefer and what you think will make the work easier for you. And for me, it's the standard stuff like on any other model, especially the entire running gear, which I always advise to keep removable if possible, because it'll make the painting and weathering not only easier, but also the final result will be much better and more detailed. Then of course I always wash the model to get rid of any dust, fingertip grease and other nasty stuff which will negatively affect the paint. Of course, this is just an artistic representation, because I'm holding the model in one hand and recording with the other, but normally I always use an old toothbrush or a large soft paintbrush to clean the model with some soap. Now we have to leave the whole thing to dry. This can be accelerated by blowing air through your airbrush on the model and blasting the water away, but I still had to leave it sit in a box overnight to make sure it's all dry and no new dust will collect on it. And I also prepared all the small bits by sticking them to cocktail sticks, wooden pegs and also the mantle it was slid over a spare gun barrel. I find it very important to prime metal parts with a dedicated primer. These things are like some self-etching glossy varnish which creates a hard shell over the surface and it makes the paint adhesion a lot better. I had a lot of problems with peeling paint in the past, just holding the model by the gun or its metal fenders, even in gloves, it would result in the paint peeling, but metal primer is here to fix all of that. However, I never apply it over mesh screens. These are very fine details and the primer can block some of the openings, which obviously won't look very nice. Now for the actual primer. Again, I decided to go with Ammo's one shot because I ran out of Mr. Surfacer and this one doesn't smell as horribly as the other. However, I don't know if something happened with this bottle because I've had it for well over a year by now, but the primer had very poor coverage and I don't remember it being this translucent in the past. So yeah, more like ammo 10 shot primer. And I'll get myself the good old trusted Mr. Surfacer in a spray can again. Even if it smells horribly, you don't have to spend an hour priming a large bottle like this. Now for some paints. I received a bunch of acrylics from Mission Models to try out and I'll talk about them more as we move on. So the real Yak Tiger 331 had the lower portions of the hull left in the original factory oxide red primer, namely areas where side skirts used to be and also the sides of the lower hull. I only added a few drops of Mission Models thinner to the paint because at this point I wanted to achieve good coverage. The primer color is also pretty nice, looks quite accurate and dries into a matte finish, just like the real thing. I also sprayed it behind the gun mantlet and inside of the mantlet as well. You know how I like my colors to be light and pale, right? So I decided to lighten it up a little bit with German yellow and sprayed it in this irregular striped pattern to create some discoloration wasn't working too much so I tried adding some rust from life color. By the way, you can mix mission models and life colors without any issues. You can also use life color thinner. And so I sprayed some more random clouds. At this point I felt like the primer color is quite okay, but I had no idea how it would work with the camouflage. 
Well, there's not much to be done if you can't imagine it other than just moving on. And this meant masking. First of all, I used masking putty on the lower hull. The real vehicle had the area behind the wheels painted with dark yellow from the factory, which can be seen on one photo. And this was a common practice to paint these areas with a paintbrush so the tank could be then sprayed as a whole, even with the wheels already attached. But the late war production of this tank hunter resulted in some shortcuts. And one of them was just omitting the whole lower hull and just spraying the vehicle with the side skirts already bolted in place. Normally I'd paint this strip of yellow with a paintbrush to make it more authentic, but you can't brush mission models paints on top of each other without varnishing, as they will start melting together, even if you thin the paint with tap water. So now I mask the strip where the side skirts used to be. Here I made extra sure there won't be any underspray later, so I also employed some masking fluid. And then I mixed a pale German yellow. They already offer a pale version of Dunkelgelb, but I still find it quite dark for my needs, so I mixed it with basic white. The ratio was very exact. 20 drops of dark yellow, 5 drops of white, and 15 drops of Mission Models Thinner. I didn't add any of their poly additive because, again, I'm more concerned with good coverage. Now, the thing with mission models is I'm not very used to these water-based acrylics like Vallejo, Life Color, Ammo or mission models. At least when it comes to airbrushing as I much more prefer the lacquer type like Tamiya, MRP or AK Real Colors. But I was asked by Domino, which is a European mission models distributor from Belgium, link down in the description, go check them out if you want to buy something. So I was asked if I want to try them out. And I was like, you know, I prefer Tamiya's over everything, but hey, I'll gladly try them out. And the thing is, they're water-based acrylics. So they're very different to Tamiya's or Gunze's or whatnot. That's pretty obvious. They don't smell, which is always a nice thing, and I quite like them for this general airbrushing and base coating. I can even imagine doing some color modulation with them, and I mean, this dark yellow base coat looks really nice. But before we proceed to the next step, I want to emphasize how important it is to keep your airbrush clean before you attempt any detail work with it. It should be absolutely pristine inside. The needle and trigger should move freely and the nozzle, especially the nozzle, deserves a lot of attention because one would be very surprised how much gunk can collect inside of it. When I was cleaning it after the Crusader vignette, I even found a strand of static grass inside. And to be sure all the gunk has been removed, I used these airbrush cleaning brushes and Mr. Tool Cleaner, which is very strong and effective. So now for the camo. I wanted to try these Mission Models colors, Red Brown and Reseda Green, because they look really nice and fairly accurate. I also used their dedicated thinner and poly additive to make them spray smoother. Unfortunately, and I'm really sorry for this, but no matter how much I tried, I just wasn't able to make them work. I followed their instructions, um, mixing ratios, recommended air pressures, just everything, but the paint was either too translucent to a point where I would need at least a dozen layers to make it somewhat opaque, or it was sputtering uncontrollably. Now, I'm gonna admit, and many of you who saw me painting the Crusader already know, I'm not very good with airbrushes, especially when spraying camouflages. I struggle a lot with Tamiya paints as it is, which are generally easier to spray than water-based acrylics, so I was kinda expecting that my results with these paints won't be very good. I don't think they're bad, it's just they didn't go very well with my clumsiness. And also, I don't know, I think they all need a bit more mixing, because the Reseda green is quite vivid, while the olive green is very dark. 
I don't consider it to be a bad thing and I'll try to give them another shot in the future, but as expected, I resorted to Tamiya paints, which I'm more familiar with. Again, even this result is far from good, but I felt much more confident with this. I also mixed the paints specifically the way I wanted them to look, and yes, this is the color scheme we're going for on the Yak Tiger. So I liked these colors so much I stored them in spare bottles for later use, and my intent was to make them again very bright, pale, but also kinda less saturated so they'll look like military colors. I was also mixing them by eye so to speak, so you know, no real ratios, and I just kept going until I liked the color. So if you like them as well, you can use these colors and just play around on your own. Even if I try to give you any estimates, I'll be just pulling them out of thin air, but hey, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> 10 parts red-brown, 5 parts dark yellow, 3 parts red, um, 7 parts yellow-green, and 10 parts clear varnish. And for the green, 10 parts of this pale green mixture I used on the Tiger F13, 5 parts natto green, 5 parts yellow green, and again 10 parts clear varnish. You could also mix this from natto green, yellow green, and white. So let's start spraying. Well, before we start I decided to draw the pattern with a pencil. I can't even imagine spraying the camo and constantly looking at pictures at the same time. So I felt like this will be easier, and it is. <laughs> so it's a good trick, not only if you're trying to replicate a real camouflage as closely as you can, but also when you're making up something on your own. Also, I must say the color profile from the kit instructions is fairly accurate, although there are some inaccuracies, so I also used real photos of the 331. Alright, let's start with the green, because it's always best to start with lighter colors and finish with darker ones. Besides, that's also how it was done on the real vehicle, because there are a few spots where brown was sprayed over the green patches. But let's talk about the airbrushing part. Well, like I said, I'm pretty bad at this type of detail work because I... I just lack practice. Those of you who have seen my model collection in one of the previous videos might have noticed how most of my models are just single color, and those with some sort of camouflage were usually painted over a layer of chipping fluid, so I could make the camo more worn down. This approach meant that I was never worried about any overspray or paint sputtering because the chipping fluid also serves as a kind of spray mask, and any overspray can be easily chipped away. So that's a brief history lesson about why I am bad at airbrushing. And now let's talk about how I tried to fix this issue. So I called my good friend, who's an absolute airbrush god, you can check him out on Instagram, although he only posted two photos there, but even these do a pretty good job showing the level he's at. So I called him, we talked about the problems I've been experiencing, and he told me to try a few things. Adding gloss varnish into the paint, which I already did, a lot of gloss varnish, as it makes the paint flow a lot smoother. Then adding paint drying retarder from Tamiya, which I don't have, and I didn't want to wait until it arrives. Plus, he said he's been working without it for a long time, so hey, I guess it's not totally necessary. And last, thinning the paint a lot. But you know, what's a lot? This is where my problem might be, because even if I feel like the paint is really thin, it still actually might be quite thick for this task. Needless to say, the spray work was pretty okay in most places, uh, not so good in others, especially on the gun barrel. I still have absolutely no clue how to spray gun barrels without overspray, but hey, looking from afar, it doesn't look that bad. Like, not bad at all. <laughs> Again, I really like the green color, it's light, but not overly pale like I had on the Tiger. So it's still easy to tell which color is yellow and which is green, so that's a small win. And let's now continue with the brown. Now this color was much more difficult to spray smoothly. 
but on one hand it wasn't such a big deal because the faint sputter isn't so obvious on the green parts, but on the yellow it's quite bad. Now my airbrush is a HNS Evolution with 0.2 nozzle and at this point I was starting to wonder if it's not in the airbrush. <laughs> I've had it for a very long time, I never did any maintenance or anything, so you know, comforting myself with the idea that I can blame my results on faulty gear, <laughs> I called my friend again and well, Many of you will find this obvious, but hearing that the nozzle gets worn down over time was something I've never even thought about. Like, the constant movement of the needle against the nozzle will grind the material away after a few years, and it should be replaced regularly. There's also a chance the tip of the needle might be bent slightly, just, just, just very slightly without you even seeing or feeling it with your finger, but it'll affect the paint flow which is only gonna be evident while doing precise work such as this. So after some discussion he recommended me an airbrush he swears up and down is one of the best ones he ever used, and yes he even has an Ivata airbrush. So it was quite a shocker to me. A cheap Fengda BD180 for 38 euros, which is like, uh, it's cheaper than a replacement needle and nozzle for Ivata. <laughs> so obviously such a price is an absolute steal and I bought it, and you'll see it later in this video, and I gotta say it sprays better, but I still can't get perfectly smooth color transitions with it. Interestingly, it only sputters when I pull the needle just a tiny bit, but it starts spraying smoothly when I open the nozzle a bit more, you know? So now I'm pretty sure it's the paint. I should dilute it a lot more so it'll flow smoothly even if the gap between the needle and nozzle is super tiny, but I didn't have enough time to experiment further. After all, this was all done when the Yak Tiger was airbrushed. But of course, I'll experiment with it in the future. So, okay, with our not great, not terrible airbrushing out of the way, it's time to peel off the masking tape. And just as I was partially expecting, the primer, although quite accurate, is rather dark compared to the pale top colors. Not a big deal, my friends, I'll deal with it once the model is varnished. So, now we need to add the dots. This ambush pattern had yellow and green dots, and there was a lot of them. I tried replicating the position, size and shape of those which I was able to see in historical photos, and the rest… I just had to make it up. One thing is that they were never perfectly round, so I'm quite sure they were applied with a paintbrush either in a factory, because a lot of these late war tanks were already camouflaged in a factory, or in the field, it doesn't matter too much. So for the yellow dots I used the same mission models mixture, 20 drops of pale yellow, 5 drops of white, but this time I diluted them with tap water. And the green, I used it straight from the spare bottle because I already diluted it with lacquer thinner. We must be careful when brush painting lacquer paints as the thinner can damage the paint, but it wasn't such a big deal in this case, as all we have to do is just give the surface a little dab, you know, no need to move the brush around on the surface. So yeah, this was super easy, relaxing and enjoyable, and oh my goodness, I can't wait to start weathering this thing. This is my first time creating a camo like this and now I can see why they're so popular. Anyway, time for some gloss varnish because the next step is decals. I know that you don't need to gloss before decals because they'll sit nicely even without it if you use setting solutions, but the mission model's base coat is really fragile and I wanted to make sure the decal solution won't mess it up. So I only sprayed the varnish where decals will be, and the interesting thing about the Tiger 331 is that the German crosses were red. That's like… I mean, super unique. Looking at historical photos, I think there was a very faint white outline, but honestly, it doesn't bother me too much, mine will be just red. And yeah, Takom decals are quite thick and stiff. Now, what does it mean for us? Well, first of all, they need 
a lot of decal softener to make them conform over the roll steel texture we have on the model. Normally decals will just conform on their own, but in this case I also had to push them against the surface with a stiff brush. The other thing is that the carrier film will create a visible step around each decal, so to reduce this I decided to sand it down. Yeah. <laughs> So first we have to cover the decals with another good layer of clear varnish. This will luckily eliminate the off-putting silvering on the carrier film. And once the varnish is dry, we're gonna use a microfine sanding sponge or a very fine sandpaper, like 2000 grit or even more. It's also important to sand it wet, so using tap water. And be very gentle and patient. This will remove some of the varnish on top and thus it'll smooth out the visible edge of the decal. Unfortunately I wasn't able to sand them as much as I wanted because the dark yellow base started to come off, so I had to stop right there, fix those spots with a paintbrush and seal it all again with Tamiya gloss varnish. Again, not perfect, but good enough, I think. <laughs> And the little that's left visible, I'll just try to hide it with oil paints, chipping and overall weathering. I especially like how this cross traced the weld bead texture. Again, these decals are very stiff, so that's quite an achievement right there. And also, yes, the real Yagtiger had them like this, one was higher than the other. Now for some detail painting. There's not much to be done at this point except painting a few parts with ammo dark yellow, which has a slightly different tone than the one I used and it'll create subtle contrast between these details and the rest of the model. And the remaining details… you know the drill. These have to be painted later down the road, after washes, oils, chipping and rust tones because right now… They just get in our way and there's also like no point in varnishing details like wooden handles or steel tow cables because they have their own unique textures. The final unifying layer is satin varnish from VMS. Now this is sort of a magic potion because on one hand it's quite thick, but it can be sprayed straight from the bottle and the magic is in its application. It should be applied wet, so not as a fine mist like we would do with let's say Tamiya, but a generous layer where it just wets the surface, but of course without pulling around details. It dries very fast and once it does, it's, I mean, it's, it's insane how smooth the surface is. Seriously, when you touch the surface after it's been varnished, I suppose that's how velvety smooth feels like. Personally, I think it could have been slightly more shiny, but that's just a small nitpick. It's a great product and it can even level out some subtle orange peel texture, so highly recommend it. Now I went on to deal with the oxide red. I mixed a rather pale color using these Vallejo paints. Again, no exact ratio, I just kept adding lemon yellow until it looked good and also some flat base from Tamiya, because Oxide Primer was totally flat. And that's also the reason why I'm dealing with it now, as it'll create some subtle contrast between the satin tank and the Oxide Primer. Personally, I don't like the Oxide Primer sites, and if it were for me, I'd rather leave them in dark yellow without any camouflage, but hey, the real Yak Tiger was like this, and I want to make the model as accurate as I can. Also, the only towing eye on the tank is quite dark on black and white photos, so there's a high chance it was also left in factory primer. And finally, wheels. I hesitated with this because on photos it seems like there were dark yellow, but then again, some subtle variation can be seen on some pictures, so you know, there's a small chance they were camouflaged as well. I mean, the tank was very dusty, so it's hard to tell and I guess it would matter too much after the model is weathered either, but I already painted and weathered a set of these wheels in dark yellow on the Tiger, so this is gonna be a nice change. And the model looks more um, complete with them like this. It was looking quite off when they were just yellow. And that, my friends, is it for tonight. <laughs> 
Now it is all painted up and ready for weathering. Of course the tracks are not painted, same as most of the surface details and tools, but we'll take care of those later. So I hope you enjoyed the video, maybe found it helpful, or if not, I hope it was at least interesting to watch. And of course, if you enjoyed it, then give it a like or a dislike if you didn't like it. And if you want to see the next step in this project, then make sure to drop by the next Friday. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe because a lot of people, like 60% who are watching my videos, are not subscribed. I know, weird. But anyway, the next video will be about the initial weathering effects, like um, enamel pin washes, because <laughs> I'm not entirely sure which other techniques I'm gonna use. I don't feel like this one needs a filter, but I might use oil dots or maybe some speckling with oils or something, because we are all about texture on this channel. <laughs> and obviously a complex paint job like this doesn't lend itself too much for the distressing technique, so instead we'll have to create the faded texture in some other way. There will be also some streaking to make some of those, you know, subtle dirt effects, and then in the next video after that we'll do chipping and then we'll see what's next. I also plan on adding some stowage, but this time I decided to add it after the model is painted and weathered, so we'll be able to try something new again. But before we get there, I want to say a massive thank you for watching the whole video and also a big shout out to my wonderful patrons who make this weekly show possible. My Patreon page is like a magazine subscription because you can get metric tons of additional content by joining. There's like almost daily photo updates from each of my projects, I always discuss a lot of things there, in case of this model it was about airbrushes, mission models, paints, thinners and so on. Then there are also one week early ad free videos, so you'll be able to watch the next one right now. Also these very nice professional like looking photos like the ones playing in the background and also DMs so we can get in touch and you can for example show me your models, ask for advice or just talk about random stuff. So if you'd be interested I'd appreciate it a lot. Anyway that's all I have my friend so I'll see you in the next one and until then stay safe, build your own models, have fun while you're at it. Have a great weekend or day or evening depending on when you're watching this and I'll catch you mates the next Friday. Cheers!